It may not have looked like a promising future after Joseph was rejected by his own brothers and sold into slavery. But God had a plan that included mercy and a mighty deliverance. He raised Joseph out of slavery and into a powerful position over all of Egypt and revealed to him things that no one else knew. When famine came, Joseph was prepared and many lives were saved, including the brothers who had once despised him. With open arms, Joseph received his father Jacob, his brothers, and all their families. They lived happily together in Egypt, enjoying the blessings of God's great deliverance. But time passed, and a new pharaoh rose to power who did not know Joseph or remember how God had delivered them from famine and certain death. Instead, he felt threatened by the people of Israel, who were now growing in numbers and strength. Out of fear and evil in his heart, this new king forced the people of Israel into slavery and did everything he could to stop them from becoming a mighty people. Yet another pharaoh attempted to destroy the people of Israel by demanding that every son born to the Hebrews be killed. Throw them into the Nile River, he commanded. He would rather murder them than watch them continue to live in the goodness and blessings of God. Little did this king know that he sought to destroy a nation of people God had promised would be great. God was preparing his people for one of the greatest deliverance stories of all time. During the time of Pharaoh's evil order, a Hebrew woman gave birth to a baby boy. She named him Moses. Seeing that he was no ordinary child, and his life was already marked with God's favor and mercy, Moses' mother hid him from Pharaoh's men as long as she could. When she could no longer keep him hidden, she devised a hopeful plan. She built a strong basket and coated it with tar and pitch so that it would float like a tiny little boat. She then placed baby Moses inside, took him down to the Nile River, and hid him in the tall grass along the water's edge. As she watched him drift down the river toward an unknown future, tears filled her eyes. She was sad to let him go, but her hope was in God. Moses' sister Miriam ran along the riverbank, watching the basket as it swiftly drifted downstream. She anxiously looked ahead, hoping for a miracle to save her little brother's life. The basket soon broke away from the bulrushes and plants, and came into view of an Egyptian princess and her maidens who were bathing in the river. When the princess noticed the curious basket floating in the water, she sent one of her maidens to fetch it. What a surprise to see such a beautiful child looking up at her. His cries melted her heart. Immediately she recognized it was a Hebrew baby boy. I will raise him as my own, she said, as she held on to the child protectively. So Moses began a life of privilege and pleasure among the royals in Egypt. But one day he would give it all up to gain a treasure that only God could give. Moses was a very young child when he was taken from the care of his mother to live in the royal courts of Egypt. Although raised a prince, he would never forget the family to which he was born. Moses was a Hebrew, the special people of God's promises. The faith of the Hebrews remained in Moses' heart even as he grew up surrounded with all the power, riches, and pleasures that Egypt had to offer. Forty years passed, and Moses grew from a boy into a man. But even though he was raised in the Egyptian way of trusting riches, horses, and chariots, God continued to draw Moses' thoughts away from Egypt and toward his fellow Hebrews. One day, he went out to see his people who were forced to work as slaves. The things he saw were terrible, including an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. When Moses saw this, it broke his heart, 
and filled him with anger. It was as if this man were attacking his own brother. Moses waited until he thought no one was watching. Then he charged toward the Egyptian, killed him, and buried his body in the sand. But as Moses would soon find out, someone had seen him, and word of his crime spread quickly. The next day, Moses went out to his people again, but this time he saw two Hebrews fighting with each other. In disbelief, he confronted them. Men, you are brothers. Why do you hurt each other in this way? One of them replied, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you going to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian? Moses was terrified. Everyone knew his awful secret. Meanwhile, Pharaoh was furious when he heard what Moses had done. By defending a Hebrew slave over an Egyptian taskmaster, Moses had rebelled against Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh ordered that Moses be captured and killed immediately. But Moses had already fled far away into the wilderness. Moses left Egypt behind. But this was just the beginning of his story. Moses ran for his life until he came to a place called Midian, where he rested at a community well. Seven women arrived at the well to get water, but they were driven away by a band of rival shepherds. Moses sprang into action to defend the sisters. He quickly defeated the shepherds, then helped the girls water their flock of sheep. When Jethro, the girl's father, heard about what Moses had done, he insisted that Moses be brought home and given a hero's welcome. Over the next 40 years, Moses would find a new home in the land of Midian and in the household of Jethro. In time, Jethro gave one of his daughters to Moses as a bride, and Moses started a family. As the years passed, Moses would learn humility and the strength of a good shepherd. When the time was just right, God would call upon Moses to lead one of the greatest deliverance stories ever. One day, Moses decided to take his flock of sheep to the far side of the wilderness toward Mount Sinai. Though this journey was unfamiliar to his sheep, they trusted Moses. For more than 40 years, Moses had learned the confidence and compassion of a good shepherd. He led and protected his sheep. God was using Moses' time as a shepherd to prepare him for an incredible task. Moses was going to lead God's people out of slavery and into freedom. As Moses led his sheep, they eventually came to a canyon near the base of Mount Sinai. It was surrounded by a range of smaller hills, so it would be safe, and it had some grass for his sheep to graze. As Moses searched the area for wolves and other dangers, he noticed off in the distance a large bush covered in flames. Moses rushed toward it. As he neared the bush, he could see that it was burning, but the fire did not destroy it. Alarmed and curious, Moses moved even closer. Suddenly, a voice came from the bush. Moses, Moses, do not come any closer. Take off your shoes, because the place you are standing is holy. Moses fell back in awe and did as the voice commanded, taking off his sandals and bowing low. Moses gave this strange and wonderful sight his full attention, and the voice continued to speak. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God speaking to me? Moses trembled and did not dare to look at him. The Lord God continued, I have seen the sorrow of my people who are in bondage under Egypt's great power. I have heard their cry, and I am familiar with their pain. It is time for me to deliver them. Moses continued to listen as God spoke. Get ready. I am sending you to Pharaoh to set my people free.
Long ago, Moses had dreamed of helping his people, but so much time had passed, and Moses was uncertain. He asked, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead your people out of Egypt? God assured him, I am with you, and I am going to prove it by bringing my people safely out of Egypt. Moses continued to hesitate. What should I tell the children of Israel when they ask who you are and what your name is? God replied, Tell them, I am who I am sends you. And he added, Tell them that this will be my name forever. But Moses became afraid and wondered how he could do this. The Egyptians hated him and the Hebrews, his own people, despised him. But God assured Moses that he would go with him. Still, Moses was afraid and asked, But what if they don't believe me? God answered, Throw your staff onto the ground. Moses did as he was told, and it became a live snake. Then God ordered him to pick up the snake, and it became a staff again. God showed him another sign. Put your hand in your cloak and pull it out. When he did, his hand was full of leprosy. God instructed him to do it again, but this time, the leprosy disappeared. It would be clear to the Hebrews and the Egyptians that God was with Moses. But Moses was still afraid, too terrified to speak to Pharaoh. I am not a very good speaker, he argued. By now, God was angry at his unbelief and reminded Moses that he, the God of the universe, had created Moses and prepared him for what he was called to do. Even so, God assigned Aaron, Moses' brother, to be a spokesman and to support Moses in the days ahead. So Moses returned his flock of sheep safely to their home and, with his brother Aaron, left on the great adventure. He would shepherd the people of Israel deliver them out of the slavery of Egypt and lead them safely to a land promised to them by God. After meeting with the Israelites to let them know that God had heard their cries and was coming to their rescue, Moses and Aaron delivered God's message to Pharaoh. Let my people go. But Pharaoh refused because God had hardened his heart. Instead of showing mercy, Pharaoh was cruel and made the work and lives of the Hebrew slaves even more difficult than before. The showdown was at hand between God and Pharaoh. Who was the true king? Who was all-powerful? Whose command could not be ignored? God told Moses not to fear, but instead prepare to witness his mighty power as he forced Pharaoh to let his people go. The next morning, Moses again came to Pharaoh, and again Pharaoh refused to let the Hebrew people go. So, at the Lord's command, Moses told Aaron to stretch his staff over the Nile River, and the waters turned to blood, causing the fish to die and the waters to become undrinkable. But Pharaoh's heart hardened further, so God sent a second plague. This time, frogs covered every inch of the land. This became so unbearable that Pharaoh begged Moses and Aaron to make this plague stop. The morning of the following day, Moses returned to Pharaoh and commanded him to let God's people go. And again, Pharaoh refused. God had Aaron strike the dust with his staff and gnats swarmed the land, covering both people and animals. When Moses came to Pharaoh again the next day, Pharaoh again refused Moses' request to let the people go. In response, God sent a fourth plague, flies. Like a black cloud, flies covered every part of Egypt, except where the Hebrew slaves lived spoiling the land and entering every Egyptian's house, including Pharaoh's palace. Once again, Pharaoh pleaded with Moses and Aaron to end this plague. 
God sent Moses to Pharaoh again, but Pharaoh still refused to listen to God. The next day, God sent a severe plague upon the Egyptians that killed their donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. This hardened Pharaoh's heart even more against God. Again, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh refused God's command yet again, Moses threw soot into the air, and it became dust that covered the land of Egypt, causing all the people in Egypt to break out into painful sores. Pharaoh's heart, hardened by God, made it so he continued to disobey God's command to let the Hebrew people go. God told Moses to go back to Pharaoh and warn him that the coming plagues would be much more destructive and harsh than the last. But Pharaoh still wouldn't listen. When Moses stretched his hand toward heaven, God sent a hailstorm unlike any that had ever been seen before in the land. It destroyed plants and homes and killed animals and people. Pharaoh confessed that he was wrong, but again his heart hardened and he rejected God's command. Then God sent a plague of locusts. These insects covered the land and devoured the last remaining plants and trees in Egypt, leaving the once lush farmland surrounding the Nile a barren desert wasteland. Pharaoh was still unwilling to release God's people, so at God's command, Moses stretched his hand up to the sky, and a heavy darkness swallowed Egypt. For three days, no Egyptian saw another person or left their house. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron so he could try to make a deal to end the plague of darkness. Pharaoh said everyone could go to worship the Lord if all the Hebrew people left their flocks and herds behind. When Moses and Aaron refused this offer, Pharaoh commanded them never to come back or they would be killed. With the people still enslaved, God told Moses there would be one final plague, a plague so severe, Pharaoh would have no choice but to free God's people. God told Moses that throughout the land of Egypt, every firstborn boy would die. God told Moses to tell the Hebrews to cover the doorposts of their homes with the blood of a lamb, and God would pass over their homes. At midnight, the firstborn sons in every Egyptian household died, including Pharaoh's own son. From the lowliest of servants to Pharaoh's palace, there was no home in Egypt untouched by death. This plague so devastated the land of Egypt that Pharaoh commanded God's people to leave. The Hebrews, who had been in slavery for generations, had been set free. The final plague had the Egyptians scared, and they urged the Israelites to leave quickly. The Hebrews gathered their belongings and livestock and left Egypt with great rejoicing. To make their departure even sweeter, as this massive sea of men, women, children, and flocks and herds of livestock made their way out of Egypt, the Egyptians loaded them down with incredible treasure. Their centuries of slavery had come to an end. God delivered his people just as he had promised. God led the Israelites out into the desert wilderness. While on their journey, God cared for his people. To help them find their way, he led them in the daytime as a pillar of cloud. During the night, he appeared as a pillar of fire. These columns not only gave the Israelites direction, but also comfort. The pillar of cloud protected them from the harsh rays of the sun, and the pillar of fire kept them warm through the cold desert nights. After the Hebrews left, Pharaoh changed his mind and said, What have we done? We let the Israelites go and have lost their services. Pharaoh commanded that his chariot be made ready, and he summoned more than 600 of his best chariots and officers. As he and his charioteers rode off, Pharaoh's entire army marched behind him. 
all of Egypt's military was in pursuit of the Israelites. As Pharaoh's armies got near, the Israelites caught sight of them and began to panic. They quickly turned on Moses and asked him, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? But Moses stood firm and called upon his fellow Israelites to do the same. Fear not, and see the salvation the Lord will bring you today. You will never see these Egyptians again, for the Lord shall fight for you. Moses stretched his hand over the sea, and the Lord sent a strong wind that drove back the waters until they were parted, leaving a dry path straight through the middle. All the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea, walking on dry land with towering walls of water on both sides. After the Israelites had made some way through, Pharaoh's entire army followed them on the path the Lord had made through the middle of the sea. When Pharaoh's army had made it midway through the sea, the Lord threw the Egyptians into confusion and panic. Their chariot wheels, clogged with mud, fell off or got stuck. The Egyptians began to cry out in terror, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord fights for them and against us. Once all the Israelites had made it across safely, the Lord had Moses stretch his hand out across the sea again, and walls of water collapsed, crashing down in huge waves upon the Egyptians. Not a single Egyptian who went into the sea survived. After this mighty display of the Lord's power, the Israelites trusted him and Moses as his servant. God had freed them from slavery and from the attacking Egyptian army. Overjoyed, Moses and all the people of Israel began to sing praises to the Lord. The people sang, I will sing my heart out to God. What a victory! He has thrown horse and rider into the sea. God is my strength. God is my song. God is my salvation. I will praise him always. Through this mighty act of deliverance, God set the Israelites free. The Lord would be their God, and they would be his people.